inviting me. Um, I was a postdoc of Sangil in 2011, so it's really nice to be back here. And I'm here until the 12th or something, so if you're interested, I'm just in the office over there. Um, okay, so this is joint work with Patrick Bennett, Elario Bonacina, Nicola Galesi, Mike Malloy, and Paul Wolin. Um, okay, so I will. Okay. Good. Okay, so I'll start off slow, um, just with some definitions. So x is just a set of zero, one variables. Um, a literal is either a Boolean constant, uh, a variable, or its negation. And a clause is a disjunction of literals. Uh, the width of a clause is just the number of literals in it, and the formula is in conjunctive normal form, CNF, uh, if it is an and of clauses. Um, okay. And it's a K CNF if each clause has at most K literals. Okay, so what we are interested in here is uh, at most K for this talk. So, um, so three CNFs might have clauses with just two literals. Um, okay, so right, so what we're interested in here is how to, to, so I give you some Boolean formula and you're interested in whether it's satisfiable. Um, so of course one way you can do that is just enumerate all possible assignments to the variables and just show me this huge table that it's not satisfiable. Um, but that's not very efficient, so um, so instead, we'll use this very popular refutation system called resolution. It's, as I understand, used in SAT solvers um, and whatnot. So it, it only has one rule of inference, right? So whenever you see um, C or X and you see D or not X, then you can infer um, C or D. And that's the only thing that you're allowed to do. And what you try to do is just to derive a contradiction. Um, so for example, for this clause, what you can do is you can take x or y, and there's not x or z. Um, so from that, you can infer um, y or z. And then not y or z is just um, one of the initial clauses. So from that, you can infer z. Um, and we also have not z. So from that, you can infer a contradiction, right? And what we're interested in is just the size, um, right, the size of this refutation, right, which I'll define in a moment. Um, OK, so this is, this is just a lot of mumbo jumbo, but so refutation is just what I said it was. So it's just um, a sequence of, of memory states where your initial state is empty. Your last state, you've derived your contradiction, and every intermediate memory state is obtained from um, one of the following rules, right? So, um, so you don't have to look at the entire formula um, at the same time. You can just call the clauses as you need them, right? So one, one thing you're allowed to do is just to download a clause of the formula. So that's the axiom, download. And another thing you can do is just that one rule of inference, right? So, um, so you can do that. And then possibly there are some things during this reputation that you just don't need. So you can just delete clauses, right? So um, you can delete clauses. Maybe you'll download them later on in the proof, but you can delete them to try to maybe save some memory. Um, and, okay, something is happening. Um, okay, all right. Okay, and so then the total space of this reputation is just, um, okay, so there's different measures of space, but we're interested in just, um, so you look at all the memory states and you, look, you take the maximum of the number of literals that appear, um, and you count that with multiplicity. Um, so this is really, um, what, uh, I mean, like, similar to just 
what you would do with a computer, right? So that's how much, that's roughly how much memory you would need uh, to store this proof. Oh, uh, you don't care about L? Or? Uh, what is, what is? So, so I mean, the, you have M0 to ML, right? Yeah, but M, ML, yeah, so ML has this contradiction that I've derived, but I might have needed some very wide memory state before I reach the reach a thing. And the biggest memory state that I need is the total space. So that's how much RAM, that's how much RAM I would need in a computer. You're not to keeping all the, it's like you're not keeping all the L's. Yes. You just keep the current I and then you infer the next I plus Yeah, that's what's... Yeah what the space says here, right? Yes, and I'm counting the literals and not the clauses, so you might be interested in clause space, but here I'm actually counting the number of literals that occur, so, which is reasonable. Okay, is that, is that clear? Okay. Um, so that's the total space of a reputation, and then um, this total space of the formula is just the minimum overall reputations. Um, okay. Yeah. Right, so all right, so the first thing I want to say is um, just upper bounds. So there is a very easy uh, quadratic upper bound um, for the total space, right? So if you've got um, some unsatisfiable formula in n variables, um, then it turns out that you only need um, quadratic space. Um, and right, so the proof of that is pretty cute. Um, so you can just use the pebbling number, right? So if you just look at this reputation tree and do a brute force search, it turns out that it has pebbling number uh, at most n plus one. Um, and of course, each clause that appears in this reputation has at most n variables. So you'll have n times n plus one total space. What, what is pebbling number? Uh, right, so the, <laughs> so the pebbling number, uh, okay, let's go back here. So, so you've got this tree, and what you want to do is place some pebbles on the vertices so that um, eventually you'll cover this contradiction vertex with a pebble. And right, so what you can do is place pebbles um, at these initial uh, clauses. And every time, uh, every time a vertex has both of its parents pebbled, then you can pebble it as well. Uh, so, am I right? This is the pebbling gain introduced by Leslie Dell in the time versus space? Yes, I think so. Okay. Uh, I mean, you know, I think, infinitely more about the complexity <laughs> sum than I do. Uh, so there's a lot of co-authors on this paper, and uh, I'm certainly not the most knowledgeable in the complexity side of it. Yeah, so, uh, but yeah, so you, right, so if both of, of the parents are pebbled, then this thing becomes pebbled, and you want to be able to pebble, you want to place pebbles at the beginning so that this bottom thing eventually gets pebbled with as few pebbles as possible. Um, Tony, what is N? So N is just uh, N is the number of variables. Um, okay, so okay, so. Um, Right, so this talk is about lower bounds, which is, um, right, so this talk is about lower bounds, which is, I guess, a lot more tricky, right, because you sort of want to say, well, in every possible refutation of this formula, you actually need a lot of space. Um, and so that was a major open problem for, for a while that was only recently solved in, um, this break, breakthrough paper. So what they proved is if you just take a random KCNF, um, then it turns out that with high probability, um, you'll need to store about n clauses, each of width n, um, at the same time in memory. Um, so this gives you this quadratic lower bound 
uh, for total space. So how many clauses are there? Uh, there's a linear number, so um, so you just pick some parameter delta and you take um, a linear number of clauses. Um, but, I mean, if, if it's just omega of n, oh, oh okay. So linear, with fixed linear, and the constant is something. Yeah. Okay. Um, Right, but the uh, right. So the the issue with their proof is this k is is at most four. So uh, what's that? At least four. Yeah, sorry. K is k is at least four, and so their proof essentially just broke down. If you tried to do it for these these three CNFs, and I'll I'll say why that's the case. Um, so. Uh, Right, so basically our result is basically the same theorem um, for k equals three, right? So, um, which is essentially the end of the story for, um, for, for CNFs, right? So, um, so again, we get um, this matching lower bound um, for the total space, so this is, this is best possible. The number of clauses is slightly bigger than n, like uh, n square, n, squ n log n or n square. What happens? Is this the same bound? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Um, uh, How is it possible for like a number of clauses? Yeah, but this is random. So it should be easier to refute no. that one, that other, which is more closely, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, okay, so let me at least say how we get these lower bounds. Um, so we get this, these lower bounds by um, looking at the adjacency graph of the formula. So that's just this bipartite graph where the left-hand side um, is represented by the clauses of the formula and the right-hand side you've got a vertex for each variable and you put an edge between a clause and a variable if that variable appears um, in the clause, right? Um, and so for example, if you've got a KCNF, then this adjacency graph is going to have left degree at, at most K. Right. Um, okay. And okay, so this is this is just Hall's theorem, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, which I guess everyone knows. So, uh, but anyway, I'll just state it uh, because it's used it's used in the proof. Um, for the k c and s, where k is, k is at least four. Um, so, right, so if you're a bipartite graph and you've got good expansion, so expansion just means that the size of um, each neighborhood is at least as big as, as the set itself, then there's a matching that covers the, the left-hand side. Um, okay. And so it turns out that there just isn't enough expansion to make the proof work for three CNFs, right? So, um, so in this adjacency graph of this random formula, you just don't have enough expansion to apply Hall's theorem. So what we need is a version of Hall's theorem for um, these things which we call VW matchings, right? So, um, right, so here you've got this bipartite graph, and now um, we just use different shapes, right? So, um, so VW matching is just a set of disjoint paths where um, they all start and end um, on the right-hand side, which I guess the right-hand side is the top side in this picture. And they each have length two or four. So if they're drawn like that, then they really look like V's um, and W's. And 
what we really need is a Hall's theorem for VW matchings instead of regular matchings. Um, okay. So, um, right. So, um, so this is a theorem we proved um, in the paper, which is basically a two minus epsilon version of Hall's theorem, right? So, um, so if I fix epsilon to be less than one over twenty-three, um, and so you've got this bipartite graph. Um, each vertex on the left has degree at most three, and no pair of degree three vertices have the same set of neighbors. So these degree conditions just come from um, looking at the adjacency graph of a, of a 3 CNF. And right, so it turns out that, um, right, so if you have expansion at least 2 minus epsilon, um, for every subset of vertices, then you can actually cover the left-hand side by a, a VW matching. Right. Um, okay. So maybe I'll make um, a quick comment. I'll use I'll use the chalkboard. Um, so right. So if you actually had expansion by two, um, then it's this theorem is actually quite easy, right? So if you've got um, this bipartite graph. Um, and suppose you actually had expansion by 2 instead of 2 minus epsilon, then what you could do is you can just make a clone of this vertex set, right? So if I just do this thing, so I just make a copy of this guy, and I make anything that's, so that's x, this is the copy of x, so if x is adjacent to these guys, x prime is adjacent to these guys. So I make this bigger graph, and now what I can do is just apply Hall's theorem in this auxiliary graph, right? So if I have expansion by two, then this graph actually um, satisfies the conditions of Hall's theorem. Um, so you actually get a perfect matching in this graph. And right, so if you've got a perfect matching, then you can just lift back to the initial graph, and that means that um, right, so each vertex and its clone are actually covered by vertices here. So if you lift back, you just get a, a V matching, in fact. Right. Um, but uh, we don't have expansion by at least two, so, um, so we can't get this V matching in general. But if we, but if we use Ws, then we can get this 2 minus epsilon theorem. What about like 1.5 is not good enough or something or what? Uh, yeah, so I'll comment on that at the end. But 1.5 is actually not good enough. Um, so you might think 1.5 is, is good enough because, so certainly you need 1.5 because um, Ws themselves expand by, by 1.5. So, um, so you might think that 1.5 is, is the answer, but like, it's not, so I'll show you. Why at, at the end? Um, okay. Uh, all right. So, okay. So, um, yeah. So, what is, wh okay, why do we need this theorem here? Um, right. So, in order to get these lower bounds, um, we essentially get them by some combinatorial game, right? So, um, so you've got this combinatorial game where there's two players, um, choose and cover. So cover is trying to cover things and choose is choosing things. So this game is played on a bipartite graph. At each step of the game, um, there's a VW matching that's um, being maintained. Um, and so it's at the i plus first step, um, choose can, okay, so choose can choose to just destroy a component of this VW matching. That's a, 
that's a legal move. Um, or if the number of, com of, of connected components is less than this parameter that comes with the game mu, uh, then she can choose a vertex and challenge cover to, to extend the VW matching to also cover that vertex. OK. Um, so the or is between the choice of the player or in the rules of the game? So the player has either the, these two choices or if fi is strictly less than uh, the player is obliged to, to pick a vertex? No, no, this game goes on forever, potentially. Um, I think the question is chooser. It can either remove a connected component or uh, yeah, at, 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 but can he like if the number of component is less strictly less than mu? Yes. Can you still remove a component? Yes, yes, you ah. can if you want. Okay. Um, okay, and right. So cover loses the game if at some point she cannot answer one of these challenges, and otherwise cover cover wins. Right. So. Um, okay. That's 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 the game. Um, mu is mu is fixed in before the. Yeah. So mu is just some parameter of the game um, that comes with with the graph. So the game is played on this graph with this parameter um, with this parameter mu. So, so the game ends when there is a challenge, right? Uh. The game, the game ends, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I guess the game either goes on forever, <laughs> in which case cover wins, um, or at some point um, cover cannot answer one of these challenges, and then the game is the game is finished. Okay. All right. Um, uh, uh, I have a question. So we uh, pick, uh, choose to pick a vertex. Then uh, challenge you cover to find the matching uh, VW matching FI plus one, which contains that vertex. Yeah, so it has to contain that vertex and it has to also extend, um, I see. extend the current, the current VW matching, right? Um, and this vertex can be on the left side or the, <coughs> or the right side. So if if the player choose never challenges the opponent then may end up in a, an empty empty matching? Uh, yeah, you can <coughs> then if you if if choose you're saying like never she can, she can uh, remove opponent. Oh, uh, only f only from the from the current VW matching, but not from the graph. Like so. So choose can remove remove either a V or a W, like from the current from the current matching. But those things are still those edges are still in the graph. Uh, when you pick a vertex, you have to choose a vertex not currently instant with FI, right? Well, if you do, then uh, sure, not or yeah, sure. Or, or I mean, or the cover. It's a silly choice to do that, I guess, because it's already covered. Yeah, but um, sure. Um, <coughs> right. Um, okay. Um, What's the F zero? So, so, so if sorry, uh, sorry, I don't understand the game, right? Okay. So, if say the the choose player removes. Uh, Right, so it just plays again, right? I mean, I mean, the players play optimally, right? That's what you assume. You assume that they play optimally the players in the game, right? Yeah, I mean, they're trying. Yeah. They're trying to, but yeah. So choose could do that, and and she would, she would, she would, she would, she would lose. Like, yeah, she would, she would lose the game. Um, okay. Um, Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I'll just what leave. That, uh, what is the 
what does that mean? F i plus one extends to f i. Uh, yeah, so it just means that, um, yeah, so there is some current VW matching. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, and right, so, um, right, so choosing this vertex just means that you want to um, just have the same components here. So I can, I can do that. Or maybe I maybe I do that um, as a valid choice for for cover, right? So cover this f i plus one means extending means that um, you're really not changing the rest of the the v w matching. So it's yeah. forbidden to extend a v to a w. Yes. Oh, is it forbidden? Yes. <coughs> Okay, can I change V to W by adding extra two edges? Uh, <laughs> that's forbidden, oh. as I understand. Um, okay. Right, and uh, so, right, so the main point of this game is that um, if you can prove that cover wins this game um, with appropriately chosen parameter uh, mu, then that actually gives you these total space, um, these total space lower bounds. Um, I won't like go into that <laughs> part, of, part of the talk, um, but that's essentially where these, um, that's how they prove these um, total space lower bounds. Um, and the way that you prove that cover can win this game is via um, oh, it's on the next slide anyway. Um, this two minus epsilon Hall's theorem, right? Um, so yeah, so let me right. So what this game is going to be played on um, the adjacency graph of a random this random um, 3 CNF with some appropriately chosen parameters. So there'll be a linear number of variables. And with this appropriate choice of mu, um, you can prove that cover is going to, to win the game um, by this 2 minus epsilon Hall's theorem. Right? So this is just to motivate this 2 minus epsilon Hall's theorem. Um, but uh, Anyway, I think it's kind of of interest in itself, possibly, um, just as some combinatorial, um, some combinatorial lemma, right? So, um, okay. So, and the proof of this thing is pretty nice. So let me actually like, use the board, um, and it's fairly short. Uh, I still have time, left. lots of time. Um, okay, so for the rest of the talk, I will um, just quickly go over this proof and also comment on um, this the correct value of epsilon um, because we have a conjecture what what the answer should should be. Um, okay, so uh, yeah. this is kind of, okay, let's just use this. I, I don't care if my hands get dirty. Okay, so, um, right, so we've got this graph here where, um, so again, it's got left degree at most three. Um, maybe it's something like that. And right, so no two degree three vertices have the same set of neighbors. So the first thing to do is, it's a bit convenient to think of this in terms of hypergraphs instead of this bipartite graph. 
So, um, so what we do is we make a hypergraph where I take this set of vertices and I just put in a hyper edge um, for each neighborhood, right? So this hyper edge there and this hyper edge here, right? And right, so since, right, so no pair of degree vertices have the same set of neighbors. Um, and so that implies that actually the number of hyper edges is the same as the number of vertices, right? Um, okay, so let's, if this is G, let's call this H of G. Um, okay, so you've got some hypergraph. Um, maybe it's something like that. And right, so what you want to do to this hypergraph is you basically want to choose a pair in each hyper edge. So you want to maybe take that edge, let's say, and maybe you take that edge, right? And so what you want to do is you want to choose, so if there's n vertices here, um, you want to choose uh, n of these edges um, so that each hyper edge contains exactly one edge. And these edges are either a single edge or paths of length two, right? So, um, so something like this will lift back to a V. And something like this will lift back to a W, right? Um, so we can call this, well, let's, let's also just call this a um, VW matching. of this hypergraph. Right. So in the W, you may have uh, two edges, right? Possibly. So it, yeah. Um, they cannot be necessarily induced, right? Uh, the W, this thing? In the W, you may have uh, some, these two edges was possible, right? Uh, this is not an induced, induced matching, right? This no, 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 this is not. Yeah, it's not an induced matching. Um, okay, so now we will just, uh, right, so we'll take a minimum counterexample, and so in this minimum counterexample there'll be some forbidden configurations, right, so, um, Okay, so let's draw these guys. That's one. That's another one. That's another one. Um, let's draw this thing too. just draw numbers. Um, well, I'll just put a one, 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 uh, this is one, two, one, and this is one, two, one, Okay, so these numbers that I've drawn uh, just represent the degree in the in the hypergraph, right? So if you see a one here, it means that that the degree of this of this vertex is actually one, which means that this is the only hyper edge that um, contains that vertex. Right? And um, in this picture, I've got a two here, so. There, is, there are only two hyper edges that contain that vertex, and we see them both um, in the picture, right? And so if any of these configurations appear, 
um, well, they can't appear in a minimum counterexample, right? Because, um, so for example, let me just take one of them, say this guy. Well, what I can do is if I see this, I can just take um, this path of length two here, right? And once I've done that, I can just um, delete these two hyper edges. And these vertices have no more edges that are adjacent to them, right? So once I delete those, I apply induction. So I get this VW matching that covers the rest of the hypergraph, and then I lift it back to a VW matching of the original guy, right? So, um, and each of these guys has, um, right, so there's that thing there, um, there's that thing, there's that thing, and there's that thing, right? Um, so none of these configurations can appear like in my, in my hypergraph. Um, okay. So, okay, so let me uh, define some things. So let's let, um, let L be, um, the set of, Degree one vertices. Um, and let's let script L be the hyper edges that contain a degree one vertex, right? So script L is a set of Um, right, so the, hi the set of hyper edges <coughs> containing a vertex of L. Okay. Um, is it possible to go there or is it? Is it? Over there? Yeah. Sure, no problem. Okay. Um, all right, maybe, well, I'll, I'll stay here for now. Um, okay, so let's note that um, the size of L is actually equal to um, size of script L. Um, and that's just because um, these two configurations are forbidden, right? So you can't have two, two degree one vertices inside any hyper edge, right? Um, okay, so now what we want to prove is this concentration result for um, this set L, right? So um, let's say claim. So, um, yeah, so I claim that the size of L is actually, um, well, it's very close. So it's 1 over 2 minus epsilon, which is the number of vertices. So it's bounded above by that, but it's also bounded below by 1 minus 2 epsilon. Oh, sorry. 1 minus 2 epsilon. Um, over 2 minus epsilon times the number of vertices, right? Um, okay. Mm. Okay, so this part is fairly straightforward, right? So it's super straightforward, right? So um, right, so the size of L is equal to the size of script L, and that's actually at most the number of edges in the hypergraph. Right. And by this expansion assumption, that's at most this 1 over 2 minus epsilon times the size of V. Okay. Uh, 
maybe I will move here now. Uh, yeah, I'll move here now. Um, okay, so I should also prove something about um, the average degree. So, so three times the number of edges um, is at least times the degree. And so this is the average degree times the number of vertices. And again, this is at least d times 2 minus epsilon times the number of edges. OK. So um, right, so the average degree is at most 3 over 2 minus epsilon. OK. Um, OK, so now, right, so now what I want to do is just finish with a discharging argument, right? So, uh, so let me, maybe I'll go here. So let's do discharging. So each vertex gets a charge of its degree, right? So um, gets a charge of so each vertex B gets a charge of its degree. And each edge in script L um, gets a charge. Um, right, so it gets a charge of, well, let's say minus 3. So it gets a charge of minus 3 um, or minus 2 depending on its, its size. Um, OK, I should uh, speed this up then. Um, you mean it has 3 vertices, then we have minus 3? Yes, yes. Um, OK, so. Um, I should leave those up there. <coughs> and right, so the other the other hyper edges get no charge. Okay. Um, and then you just do this following discharging rule. So. Um, so each hyper edge gives a charge of minus one, minus one, and minus one um, to the uh, vertices that are inside it. Minus one. Right. Okay. Um, so that's the discharging rule. And right, so the nice thing about the discharging rule is that now all the edges have charge zero and all the vertices have non-negative charge. Uh, do you want to make a charge plus three and plus two? Uh, oh, my, keeping minus one means uh, subtracting one from vertex and you're adding. All right. Yeah. All right, I was confused. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, 
So in other words, you can you take one away from vertex to yes, uh, right? right. <laughs> uh, sure. Okay. All right. And right. So right. So all the edges have zero charge after discharging, and all the vertices have um, have non-negative charge, right? Um, right. So because of this concentration bound here, um, so the total charge. Let's call it C, right? So you can prove that the total charge is actually at most um, this six epsilon over two minus epsilon times the number of vertices, right? Um, okay, and. Right. So now you want to you want to consider um, the vertices that have zero charge after discharging. Right. So let's see. Okay. I still have time. So let Z be the vertices um, with zero charge. Uh, and that's after discharging. Yeah, so so the total charge is Yeah, so you'll get but you need to subtract out like the lower the lower bound. Right? So uh, Um, okay. So, um, yeah, so it turns out that um, the size of Z, because of this concentration thing that I erased, is actually um, very, very close to all the vertices. So it's um, 2 minus 7 epsilon over 2 minus epsilon um, times the number of vertices. So there's actually lots of vertices. Um, there's lots of vertices with zero charge um, at the end. Um, oh, right. Um, and some of them I don't care about. Some of them I don't really like, right? So note that um, note L. Um, okay, so L is a subset of Z, right? Um, so every vertex in L is is also in Z, um, but those actually aren't that interesting for me, right? So because I'm trying to actually find. Um, one of these configurations. Okay. Um, okay. Maybe I should actually skip to what I uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> said I would do about the the epsilon. So, um, but for ten minutes or like ten minutes. Okay. Um, right. So. Uh, yeah. So. L is a subset of, of Z, um, and, I, and I don't really care about those things, right? So I, I'm really interested in Z take away L. And that thing is still big, so it's, um, 
right, because I had this lower bound. So that thing is 1 minus 7 epsilon over 2 minus epsilon times the number of vertices. Um, right. Right, because I had this upper bound on um, the size of L that I unfortunately erased. Um, okay, so, right, so now I've got this 3 over 2 minus epsilon times the number of vertices. That's at most, um, right, so that's the average degree times V. Um, right, so if I look at this thing, um, so I can just sum um, the vertices in L, um, their degree, and the vertices, sorry, the vertices in L, and I'm just going to sum the vertices in Z take away L. Degree of the right. Um, right, so this is the this is the degree sum, and I'm only going to sum um, these degree one vertices and the things that are left over. And I'm not even going to sum the other vertices that aren't in Z. Okay, so, uh, right, so this thing, right, is, uh, right, so this thing is the size of L plus, um, right, so this thing is bounded above by three, right, so this is three times the size of Z take away L, right? So these things are degree one, and these each of these contributes three, right? And I didn't even sum like the other vertices. Mm. How do not they contribute three? Could they be two? Um, it's a kind of a lower bound, so. This thing? Uh, vertices in, in Z. Um, So in the discharging rule, do you apply this rule for every edge or? Yeah, you also, I mean, I was writing this down thinking about the three uniform case. So that's why I have this three. But in the general case, there is a discharging for the, uh, for the degree two hyper edges too, where you give that thing a minus one and you give that thing a minus one. Um, so, yeah, um, I was really thinking of the three uniform case when I typed this up, so. Um, so, right, so if you do that, then we've got this bound from here, which is this one minus two epsilon over two minus epsilon plus three times, um, right, so I've got that bound there of this. Uh, 1 minus 7 epsilon over 2 minus epsilon all times the number of vertices. And if you crunch that out, that's actually equal to 4 minus 23 
epsilon over 2 minus epsilon times the number of vertices. Um, and right, so that's a contradiction if you actually compare this thing with this thing. Uh, you get this, right, so epsilon is, is at most 1 over 23. That's where that comes from. Um, okay, sorry, I kind of made a mess of that. Uh, but let me at least answer Eric's uh, question quickly, um, which is uh, what the right value of epsilon is, right? So you might think that epsilon equals, or not, okay, so that <laughs> epsilon might be one half, like, so it's written as two minus epsilon. So, um, so you might think that you could do it with epsilon equal to one half. Um, um, right, but we showed that the theorem is actually false um, for epsilon bigger than a third. Um, so you actually need um, more expansion than that. And that's also kind of cute. So I think I can show that like super quickly. Um, so, um, right. Um, So there is a gadget um, So there is this particular gadget, and you can show that every VW matching of this guy actually has to use X, right? So if I don't, if I don't use X, then I'm forced to use that thing and that thing, right? And um, yeah, so I'm forced to use that guy and that guy. These degree one things that are hanging off force me to use that edge and that edge because there's only one possible choice for the degree two things. And so that means that I cannot use this edge here um, because it's going to make this thing. So I'll, I'll, I'll have to cover that guy there. So I could do that or I could do that, right? Um, and now you're screwed, right? Because I still have to pick an edge here. And I'm going to make this path of length 3 or this longer path here. Um, so whatever VW matching of this hypergraph I take, I, I have to cover this vertex x, right? Um, OK. Um, but that isn't a, that isn't a counterexample. Like there are VW matchings of these guys. But now you can just do like an amplification trick. So if I have this guy, um, uh, here, right? So let me label that thing as X, right? So this is a hypergraph that is definitely not VW matchable, right? Because I have to take um, that guy, that guy, and that guy. And then I've got no possible choice for this hyper edge here. And then I can just do this amplification trick where I actually just replace this hyper edge with just this gadget. Right? So instead of this thing, I replace it with the gadget. Right? And right, so this isn't a counterexample because it only has well, right, so it's got four hyper edges um, and it's got six vertices. So it, it's, um, but if you repeatedly do this amplification trick and just count, so you can just keep on doing this because there's still pendant vertices out here. So if you repeatedly do this amplification trick, um, this number converges to this one third. So, um, so you can make something that's arbitrarily um, close to one third. Um, and we conjecture that that's uh, 
that's the answer. So we conjecture that um, actually if epsilon is, is less than one third, then um, which I think is like a nice a nice conjecture. Um, yeah. So anyway, I'll I'll stop. Sorry. I, I've Thank you.